Okay, so uh, our speaker this evening is Tom Whipple. Now, one or two people have said, oh, that name sounds a bit familiar, you know, the, the name Tom. No, the, na the name Whipple. Um, where, is, where is Simon? Simon, yes, okay. So Simon uh, Whipple is our speaker, one of our speaker organisers. And um, what Simon has been doing is just going through his address book, you know, family lists and that kind of thing. And uh, he, he found this guy, Tom Whipple, in his address, personal address book, didn't you, uh, Simon? So, uh, I wouldn't want to uh, <laughs> Tom to have to be presented. Uh, well, I've already, I've already associated the two of you now. So uh, I believe there is, there is a family connection. So, uh, but uh, I think of a... Of a a nephew kind of uh, connection. So there we are. Let's explain that. Um, our speaker this evening, so is Tom Whipple, he's science editor at the Times. He joined the paper shortly after graduating with a degree in maths. Among his claims to fame, he has interviewed Stephen Hawking oh. and Jedward. Oh. Some of you won't know who Jedward is. Jedward is two people. Jedward is two people. With spiky blonde hair, they are sort of an Irish singing duo, or something like that. Um, he's written a book about the secret science of radar, the battle called the Battle of the Beams, and he was named Science Journalist of the Year for his coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic. His topic tonight is how can we trust science? So will you please give Tom a big welcome? <laughs> Hello, thank you very much for having me along. Um, it's nice to catch up with my uncle. Um, and I'm sort of being a bit late. There was a literal fire on the railway, <laughs> <laughs> which is you are cut off entirely from the railway network here now. Um, so uh, I, yeah, I've been, co well, COVID took over my life. I mean, it took over all of our lives, but it took over my life, I guess, more than most in that I, I, I worked out, I've written more about COVID than Tolstoy wrote about war and peace. Um, <laughs> Uh, I first realised it was going to be big, I guess, in quite late, uh, in, in sort of February 2020. Um, and I, I really remember, because as science journalists, you're always covering the apocalypse. You know, it's always, there's a meteor doing this, or solar flares might do that, or, or you've got kind of, you know, the next pandemic, which I've covered the next pandemic many, many times. Um, and I, I was at a conference and we, um, uh, I, I, I was slightly worried because we'd been ramping it up and the, I was having a drink with some of the guests there and one of the guests was a Nobel Prize winning immunologist. Uh, and I said to him, sort of, you know, do you think we've been over-egging this? Is this, you know, should, have we been over-hyping COVID? And he just looked at me and said, I've got a house with a moat and I'm stockpiling corned beef. And I thought, right, okay, let's, um, yeah, let, let's crack on with this one. So I'm going to talk yeah, about, about this topic. I'm going to talk specifically, as I was understanding, sort of prompted by, I think, people quite reasonably thinking, you know, who to believe on things like vaccines. Um, and so I'm going to talk, I'm not going to hopefully tell you what to think, I'm going to tell you how I ended up covering the things in the way I did, uh, rightly or wrongly, and um, where, where, where I think the, the, the truth in inverted commas lies with that subject and by extension others. And afterwards I'm really happy to take questions. Um, I can't guarantee I can answer them all, but I will try. Um, I obviously am not a scientist, but I've been involved with a lot of the biggest figures during this and I've watched it unfold and it took up a lot of my time. Um, but I'm going to start with, with vaccines, and I'm going to start with uh, probably the most recent story, which some of you might have seen. Um, this was, it was on the front page of the Telegraph. Um, it's a uh, story, I think it's about a month ago, maybe less than a month ago, um, up to <coughs> three million excess deaths, and a link to vaccines. And this, this wasn't the Telegraph, this is, I have issues with my opposite number at the Telegraph. Um, but this was fair reporting of the paper she was reporting on, um, which was this paper here. Uh, and that's in the BMJ, which is a perfectly reputable journal. Um, 
Hopefully by the end I'll ex explain why I didn't cover this paper and in fact why I think this paper is now going to be retracted. Um, but uh, what I'm not trying to do, this isn't, this isn't my thing. Um, I don't think necessarily that sort of fact checking is always a great thing because it, it, it sits you in this sort of godlike position when actually all of you have is a lot of uncertainty and I think what we all came to see during Covid was a world of science unfurling as it happened in quite messy and uncertain ways and there aren't many things where you have perfect certainty. I'm going to tell you why I am pretty certain that the vaccines weren't just safe um, but saved hundreds of thousands of lives in this country alone. Um, and I'm going to do it, and I'll get into the nitty gritty, but actually I'm going to show five graphs that for me, I think pretty much answer the question. Um, so this first graph, now this is the famous Neil Ferguson graph um, showing the doom ahead. Um, there are people have lots of issues with that paper, lots of things which again I'm happy to talk about. But there's one thing that I don't think anyone serious has issues with. So this is, uh, if you look at the, the, um, the black line, that's sort of an estimate for how many people, 510,000 people, would die if uh, 60 to 70 percent of the population became infected in a single wave with COVID. And that was based on these. These are the uh, infection fatality rates. So you can see, you know, children, basically the infection fatality rate is non-existent. You've got 0.02% of zero to nine-year-olds, which was an amazing, by the way, an, an absolutely amazing benediction of COVID. You know, if, you, if you've got flu, you don't get this curve that goes like this in terms of infection fatality rate. You get one that goes like this, and you end up with people dying at both ends of the spectrum. But for this, you see, yeah, 0.002% dead. Uh, for 80 plus year olds, you're talking about 10% of people who get COVID die. And those figures essentially unchanged throughout the pandemic. This is people who are naive to COVID, first infection, no vaccination. So that is the death toll you're looking at. Now, this next graph is, uh, in fact, um, this is the more important one. This is cumulative infections in the UK. So this is. Hang on, what are we looking at? This is wave one up to there. So that's your first sort of spring 2020. Um, and then you've got sort of later waves and, and, and it goes up and up and up. Uh, and this is, this is way, th this is a, um, a, a very small, actually, so it's, yeah, this is sort of wave, wave one is actually up to here. It's a tiny number of infections. This is, um, this is not the total number of infections because that stops at 350,000 cases per million people and that basically shows that we just didn't record them all and we stopped bothering because we're essentially a million infections per million people. Now, if you look at the um, deaths, what you've got for those absolutely tiny bumps at the bottom, you've got, this is your excess deaths, it's going up to here. That is when the vaccine kicks in and this is when you go from having about 10% of the population, I think, less infected to 100% of the population infected. And you can see the change in, in the ratio. And actually, uh, what you... I, I saw a, a recalculation of the infection fatality rate now. And it's gone from across the population being about 1 in 100 people die to across the population fewer than 1 in 1,000 people die. Um, I can't see, I cannot explain those last two graphs except by saying this was the point where we started vaccinating everyone and this is also the point where the infect infection fatality rate absolutely plummeted. Um, and now we're, you know, we're a mix of vaccinated and infected and infected multiply and vaccinated multiply and that is essentially why the pandemic stopped. Um, this doesn't mean that there aren't rare side effects and the question is how rare they are and they can be they can be common enough that you still wouldn't want to go ahead with it um so i'm going to explain hopefully not too boringly how it is that we work out whether a vaccine is safe um now this first one oh, oh yeah sorry actually the last one 
So this is, you can get lots of graphs of deaths in countries um, where it's very hard to tell what's going on because the COVID waves arrive at the same time as the vaccination waves. The one country in the world that didn't happen is New Zealand. And what you're seeing here, the only excess deaths they had during the pandemic period are all explained by COVID. They started vaccinating quite slowly, but around about here. And you get absolutely nothing until you get these black ones marked COVID, which is when they finally opened up and let in the wave. And that's them having a post-vaccination wave of COVID. And um, so that's at least, that's what convinces me at a, a broader level. But then we have this surveillance system um, for uh, trying to work out whether things are are, are, are dangerous sort of at a more personal and individual level. Um, so this is the, this was our front page on the day that the Pfizer vaccine came through and it had those results, um, those sort of headline results of 95% efficacy. And I think we all learnt what those do and don't mean. Um, the way that this trial works, and I think it's worth briefly talking about what the vaccine trials actually were, because the numbers involved were both huge and tiny. Um, so in this, 44,000 people were involved in the trial. Half of them received the vaccine. Half of them received a control. I can't remember what it was. I think it was another vaccine because it induced similar sort of soreness in the arm. Um, and then that gave you then you looked for safety signals, and amongst those groups, you didn't find a difference in side effects in the control and the vaccine. And that tells you that over the period this is running, in a group that's broadly healthy, you're getting no obvious effect at that level amongst that many people. Um, the actual efficacy, I don't know how many people know this, it's sort of been lost. They only had 128, I think, infections in the whole groups so they had spread this around the world and the way it worked was you waited for people to be infected and no one knew and no one knew who had taken the placebo or the control not the people running it not any, anyone you saw headlines in, the, in that autumn where people said uh, you know oxford vaccines going to show this if those headlines were true then that was a massive scandal because no one was meant to know at all and the headlines weren't true um, so they waited until they got about 1% of the people infected, slightly less, and then they opened it up. And then the idea was, where are those 1% infected? Are they the people who got the vaccine? Are they the people who got the control group? And I think it was, a, it was well, that's how we got the 95% figure, is 95% of the people infected were in the control group. And that's all, but it's a tiny number until you think if, if I tossed a coin 128 times and it came up heads 110 times I'd be pretty certain that this coin was biased and actually if you're mathematicians you can do the calculation and you can show you're certain to this level of I mean whatever two to the do your binomial thing I can't remember but it's it's, it's a very high level of certainty um, uh, but that's how they did it and this was this was how it began though and the question is, what happens next? Because all we know is that amongst 20,000 people, you haven't got a side effect, and you haven't got it in this time period. And those 20,000 people were chosen such that they weren't very sick. Uh, they didn't have comorbidities, they didn't have other things. It wasn't the normal, you know, this, this wasn't necessarily representative, particularly of the people you wanted to save from COVID. Um, so then begins the next bit. Um, now this, you might have seen things like this. This is, I just chose a random tweet. I don't mean to pick on poor the Rustler 83. Um, I, I, I just searched for yellow card and COVID. I think most of us probably weren't familiar with yellow card system at all until COVID. Um, and what this is seeing, you can say, this is 1.5 million adverse reactions to COVID vaccines reported in the UK. Um, he's absolutely right. Um, there were, um, there are, and we're still getting adverse reactions reported. And the uh, 2,640 fatal events, I think it's actually more than that. Um, if it is that low, then they've been reporting badly. Um, there's a massive caveat. 
So this is the yellow card reporting system. And what this is, is our first way of seeing a signal. And this is, if you get a vaccine and anything happens to you at all afterwards, you're meant to report it. Um, most people don't. Um, but you're meant to. If you die afterwards, you're certainly going to report it. And um, we are all going to die after being vaccinated. It's just a question of how long. Um, and so to give you an example, so you go through this, these, these uh, 1.58 uh, million adverse reactions. So I've got, I, I sort of went through this to see what they are. Um, so you've got... Uh, well, you can see that one. There were, uh, I think about 120 of them were flatulence. Um, so you've got uh, 24 reports of electric shocks, five reports of people developing Tourette's, one of floppy eyelid syndrome, which, uh, forgive me, it's probably really serious, but it sounded funny, um, 24 reports of screaming, um, 52 people reporting hunger, and yes, 213 people um, had flatulence, none of which went on to be fatal. Um, <laughs> so the the yellow card, I don't know, I sat down with it, I don't even know what, with something like COVID, I'm not even sure what the point of the yellow card reporting system is. Um, it gets worse. So when Andrew Bridgen, the MP who's been very vocal on vaccines, stood up and said, vaccines are causing all of these heart attacks in young people, you started getting a lot of yellow card reports of vaccines because the act of publicising the fact that this is a side effect makes it a reported side effect on the yellow card scheme. It's about the st most statistically messy thing I can imagine. And I don't think anything useful came out of it in the pandemic. But there are other things. There's then a new line of defence um, which is, we can get it, yes, yeah, so these, these things. The next one is rapid cycle analysis, which is a lot better. What we've got is there's tens of thousands of GP records that are linked um, to electronic databases and provide these very rapid things. You'll see if someone's got some sort of reaction and they've been vaccinated, you can quite rapidly match them to a group of people with a similar set of comorbidities at a similar age and start saying, is this a signal that's greater than what I would expect by chance? Um, and that's the next thing. That's when you start thinking, you know, can we spot things that are at the one in a hundred thousand level? Um, with COVID, there was more than that because people were so interested. In, there were these massive studies. We had a thing called the Siren Study in the UK that followed healthcare workers because they've been they've been amongst the earliest vaccinated and they were well. So we, we got all the details, you could follow them easily, and then you're really following the minutiae. Um, and it was through things like that that we did pick up the one in a hundred thousand event. Um, and and th th this is the thing, you know, the, the system, to, I mean, the system is imperfect, but you can see how it works in that the AstraZeneca, so they, they, they picked up that blood clotting thing in about March or April of 2021, we began to see this signal. And I think it's less than one in 100,000 people would get this. Um, and it was the European system that, that spotted it first, and then it came up on ours. And what I'm showing you here is how that relates to the, um, the risk-benefit trade-off. Um, this was a great thing that um, uh, this David Spiegelholt, the statistician, produced, where he said, look, if you're in, if this is a time of low exposure, so there's not much COVID around, and you vaccinate people, what's your risk of going into ICU if you're not vaccinated and you get COVID? And that's the blue dots on the left. What's your risk if you are vaccinated and um, getting it as an adverse reaction to the vaccine? And what you can see is, as you go lower down the age group, they become closer to each other. So certainly here, this dot is bigger than this dot. And, and to an extent, that's a reflection of the fact that essentially people aged 20 to 29 did not get sick from COVID unless there's another reason. Um, but that was what informed the decision to stop vaccinating lower down the age groups with the AstraZeneca. And of course, we had the great luxury at the time that we had another one to go to. Um, other countries didn't have that. Um, if you look, the, the AstraZeneca is now basically been stopped but if you look across the world 
It probably saved a comparable amount of lives to the Pfizer vaccine, um, which was the one that we mainly ended up using in the West. Um, now, uh, what have we got for the next one? Um, the, the, other, the Pfizer vaccine, um, heart conditions. Now, this is quite an interesting one. It does cause, we're now very certain that the Pfizer vaccine causes um, myocarditis. Um, in, uh, I think it's about 1 in 30,000 people. Uh, now, most people, the vast majority of people, particularly if they're young, they get this and they recover completely from it. Um, COVID also causes myocarditis. This shouldn't be a surprise because much of what the vaccine does is what COVID does, but without the infectious agent. Um, it's very hard. You can see the signal. You can see when it appears and you can try to work out what's going on. This is deaths, which is different because actually most of, almost all of the vaccine caused myocarditis didn't cause deaths. This is deaths due, due to myocarditis. I don't think you can see a vaccine effect in there. You can't even see a COVID effect in there. Um, once you look at the population level as a whole, that particular specific side effect, which is different from all heart attack side effects, because um, COVID did cause heart attacks, um, didn't seem to lead to any noticeable change in mortality in the UK. Um, now, where am I going? So, what happened? Nevertheless, now I sort of thought that this was the end of it. Um, and then, don't worry, you don't, you don't have to be able to read this. Um, I, I'm going to talk now a bit. This is, I've talked about why I'm convinced. Um, I'm going to talk hopefully fairly, but maybe with varying degrees of scorn, um, about some of the things that I've seen pop up, and some of the reasons why I don't think it's unreasonable for people to worry and to not know who to believe. Um, this is a report that was put out and sent to MPs um, in March of 2021. Um, it was backed by uh, Graham Brady, the chair of the Backbench 1922 committee, who I, I think is either stupid or hadn't read it, um, or both. Um, this <coughs> is this graph here. Now, this is it was a very strange report. It was by this group called Heart. Um, they first of all claimed that the alpha variant wasn't more transmissible. Um, this is this is death uh, in the second wave. You remember that awful winter, and uh, we got that sort of hump. And we thought we were over it. There was a lockdown here. And then the alpha variant popped up. And we got this massive, massive peak. Um, this report said, and they've basically done this like monks off word. It's really shonky. Um, said, this is what we would have expected. They used modeling. They're really into modeling then. They got really out of it later. And this is what we would have expected if it had gone like a normal infectious agent. Since they said the alpha variant didn't exist, these deaths, they put COVID in inverted commas. And they blamed all of those deaths on the vaccine. Which, so this was a report that went out to UK MPs, was endorsed by the chairman of the 1922 committee that claimed that his government's signature policy had killed 60,000 people that winter and no one had noticed. You know, no, no one had spotted that the deaths, which all coincidentally came after they'd tested positive for COVID, were somehow linked to the vaccines, which... Actually, we've got really good data by then already that the, um, that the vaccines were saving lives. You've got this amazing thing. When you started stratifying, you could get this real rough and ready thing. And there were a bunch of statisticians who were sort of getting overly into it at the time, where you get the case rate by age group, and you get the fatality rate by age group. And one after one, you saw the drop. First the 80 to 90 year olds, then the 70 to 80 year olds, then the 60. And it perfectly correlated with the 21 days after vaccination and you were just seeing this thing come in in real time and, and in, a, in a dark winter it was it was really one of the most hopeful things um but yeah this went out it was endorsed by jonathan sumption um i, I think i think a whole bunch of people who'd actually just just not read it and i still um i wrote about it i, I, I wrote an article 250 words just saying graham brady's endorsed this and i still there's a particular academic at queen mary who's still um still abuses me and occasionally threatens to sue me for the article. Um, he was behind it. It was one of the things I learnt in this, and I sort of knew it, but never learned. There is no proposition so absurd that you cannot find a professor who will back it somewhere <laughs> in the UK. Um, 
So this was one of them which I, I, I found it baffling, ab absolutely baffling, um, that, that this had sort of popped up. Um, but then they, they kind of kept. So this was in my own paper, and I was sort of livid. Um, I mean, it's Lionel Shriver, and she's, she's a sort of, um, a, a, you know, she's a great contrarian, and I, I like a lot of her books. Um, her main, the reason I brought this up is because it refers to a particular statistical thing. So she say, it's not just Russians who are fed propaganda. Watching Putin's regime spew out lies and half-truths should make us reflect on our own government's COVID messaging. And like, guys, on, I went to the comments and said, you could have just let me see it. Um, so this was at the time, there was a really specific thing. And this is another reason why I think it's so hard, unless you've spent just four years sitting in the middle of this, to spot this. Um, this was her thing was based on a set of government statistics made by the UK, which were correct. Um, they ended up going around the world, and those statistics showed that if you got vaccinated, according to her interpretation, you were more likely to be infected rather than less. Now, these are the statistics. You don't particularly need to see them, um, but if you look, um, so. Here, for instance, in 70 to 79 year olds, the rate, this is the rate of infection is 492 per 100,000 in whatever period they're looking at. And in those unvaccinated, it's 359 per 100,000. So according to this, you are more likely to be infected if you are vaccinated. Now, what's my explanation? The first thing is, this is real world data. This isn't in a trial. So you're, the groups you're comparing are different. Um, by this stage in the pandemic, what would you expect? Caterus paribus. You would expect those rates to become exactly the same. Because if you're not being infected and getting your immunity that way, you're be, or if you're not being vaccinated and getting immunity that way, you're being infected and getting immunity that way. So you would expect them to converge. Now, having them one go higher, though, <laughs> in this stage of the pandemic is very strange. Um, they're actually in the, the paragraph below, the UK Health Security Agency put a paragraph explaining this, which, which Lionel Shriver, if she'd looked at the data rather than reading Joe Rogan's blog or whatever, would have seen. And what it was, was by this stage, so many people were infected that we had a problem in that we don't actually know how many people are in the UK. Um, we don't have a perfect census and we have to interpolate between decades. And the way that we were doing this was in the immunisation records. And it had too few people, too few or too many, I'd have to sit down and work it out. But what it meant was the unvaccinated group, the denominator was completely wrong. And they knew this, the bit that you divided by was completely wrong. So once you got up to that, the per 100,000, it just wasn't correct. And they were using, pub I think they should have probably stopped publishing this data because of what it started doing. Um, but this is the data they'd always used, but they've just not been in a situation where, particularly amongst the 70 to 79 year olds, you're talking 1% of the population or 3% of the population haven't got it, but your estimate for the size of that population is completely wrong. Um, but that one, uh, that's one of those things where I just don't think you could have spotted it unless you've basically done a PhD in COVIDology, which I had by this time. Um, this was the reform party's um, uh, their, their campaign pledge um, yesterday. Um, this is in the document that Farage put out. Uh, so it is, he wants a, a, an inquiry into excess deaths and vaccine harms. It says excess deaths are nearly as high as they were during the COVID pandemic. Um, young people are overrepresented. And, you know, what is, what is going on? Um, so that's, that's Nigel. Um, the weird thing about this is, this is our excess deaths. I hear this all the time. This dot here is what you expect. This is what we're getting. We've been trending below on excess deaths for ages. Um, as you would expect, and it's not because our healthcare has suddenly got amazingly good, it's because we killed off so many people mm. that now mm. they're not, you can only die once. Mm. Um, and this is, this is actually a weird thing, with, with excess deaths, it completely depends on the period you count them over. So if you died in a care, if you've got excess deaths over the course of the pandemic, which one of the things we've done, if you died in a care home, 
that death is simply not recorded in excess deaths over pandemic. It's not there. Because if you died in a care home, you're expected to have died in the next two years anyway. So oh, if you look at the cumulative excess over the three year period, if you died two years early, it's just not there. It's not seen. So all of these stats come with the caveats. And obviously the big caveat for this is, this is because people have already died and that's why we're under it. But we are not experiencing massive excess deaths now. Um, not at all, thankfully. We were at the beginning, a year and a half ago, during the winter, we were experiencing big excess deaths that weren't COVID. And I think probably they were linked to the ambulance service entirely falling over. Um, but we, we, we still, I think there, there, there were several things going on there. Um, which I think brings me round to the Telegraph article I started with. Um, so I will explain these graphs. Um, that Telegraph article was about 3 million excess deaths in, in 47 countries in Europe during the pandemic. Um, so the, uh, do you see the sort of red line and the black lines? And do you see how they follow each other? One of those lines is COVID deaths. And one of those lines is excess deaths. The, the paper had discovered that a lot of people died of COVID during the COVID pandemic. Um, and to make the point a little bit more forcefully, um, within those countries, and they could have shown this because the data they stole from the scientists who were really pissed off had this. These are the 10 worst performing countries in the data set they looked at. That is their vaccination rate. So that is over 33% vaccination rate, 17% excess deaths. North Macedonia, 40%, 28% excess deaths. These were the ones contributing the most excess deaths. The countries contributing the least excess deaths to those excess deaths are the ones that were the most vaccinated, um, including New Zealand that's got a minus next to 0%. I'm not quite sure why, it's a rounding thing, but it's done very well. And it, it was... I, I don't know what went on with that BMJ paper. I suspect it's going to be retracted. Um, this was why I didn't cover it. Um, and there were a few other things. There were a few other tells in it that I... That I'll explain one of them, and then I realise we've got to stop for questions in a bit. I'm sure there's lots. Um, during the pandemic, the problem is sometimes all you've got is appeals to authority. Um, you know, I'm a generalist. I... I, I'm not a virologist, so who do I trust? When everyone's got a professor next to their name, who do I trust? And the truth is, there were people I trusted in the pandemic who I shouldn't have. There were mistakes I made, um, everyone did, um, and there are the things I'm not proud of. But I did come up with some heuristics during the pandemic. Um, and I'll, these will be slightly mathsy, in, in deference to my maths background. I'll try not to make them too mathsy. Um, uh, there were a few things where I thought, you're wrong now, and you know you're wrong now, but you're saying it. Um, and so one of them was false positives. Um, this was, I think, the weirdest experience of my professional career. There was a period from summer of 2020 um, through to the beginning of the true beginning of the second wave, where we had this hallucinatory debate that COVID wasn't here and that all the PCR tests were picking up were false positives. False positives that really behaved as an epidemic, you know, they went up and down. Um, false positives are a big deal if you're screening a population, um, and it's why we don't screen for things like prostate cancer. So I'll explain why it's not completely, un un not completely ridiculous. Um, so this is, I found this diagram on the internet. If you have, imagine you have a 90% effective test for breast cancer. You think that's brilliant. That's 90%, you get that in your exams, you've got a first, fabulous. If you screen the whole population for breast cancer, of which, in this case, 990 don't have it and 10 do, what happens? With your 90% effective test, you pick up nine of the women with breast cancer. Brilliant. Of the 90, 990, you say 99 of them have got breast cancer when they haven't. And so if you screen the world mm. with a 90% effective test for breast cancer, you end up finding 11 times 
more false positives than true positives. Your test is completely useless as a screening tool. And there was a legitimate worry at the beginning of the COVID pandemic that that's what the test was doing. Um, this is a document that was put out by the UK government, which used these estimates. It said, we have some evidence that it's between 0.8 and 4%. Now, a 4% false positive rate would mean if we did a million tests, you would get, uh, oh Christ, 40,000? Uh, 40,000 positives, is that, is that right? Jesus, yes, sorry, uh, I'm, not, I'm not good on the spot. Uh, 40,000 false positives um, before you picked up anything. You would be picking up a massive wave and it would be completely useless. Um, so that's why they were worried. Um, now, I actually spoke to the person who produced this research. Um, and so, this, this is, this is you, don't, you don't need to read this at all. Um, but now, this was the next paragraph. This is the interesting thing. So that, that Spectator article I put up, it quoted this 0.8 to 4% thing. But the next paragraph in the same document says, uh, and this was in May, 2020 testing just started it says we did a hundred thousand tests and 1570 of those were positive so what that means is it is impossible for the false positive rate to exceed 1.5 percent you uh, I hope I haven't lost you um, if there was a four percent false positive rate and you do a hundred thousand tests you must get 4,000 positives. You cannot get fewer than 4,000 positives, and they're all false. So we knew already it wasn't this. Actually, we did testing in the summer, and we did 100,000 tests, and we got 50 positives. So the whole, the, the absolute maximum level of false positives, if there was no COVID in the country, is 50 out of 100,000 absolutely minuscule and that was before that article was written we know now that the false positive rate was basically zero um, but this persisted and I have there were questions asked in Parliament there were you know this drove our policy this was why we dithered for an entire autumn was because of something that is as epistemologically wrong as 2 plus 2 equals 5 so I thought anyone who's talked about that I'm ignoring you for the rest of the pandemic and I never regretted doing so um, there is one last thing because there's another Telegraph article which I think is really interesting and I'm sorry this is going to be slightly more mass but then I will stop afterwards and you can relax and ask me questions um, this was so A said, A said to be sued over a defective vaccine this article said they told us it was 70% effective Actually, it was 1.2% effective, is what this article was saying. Now, how did they get to that? Um, in fact, well, this is, this is someone else at the BMJ using the same figure. He's saying um, absolute risk reduction appears to be less than 1%. Um, the, this is another thing where, unless you've been following it, it's absolutely true. The efficacy in those trials was about 1% on that basis. Um, there are two figures, relative risk and absolute risk. So this is a good example, and journalists are always guilty of this. We'll say, this drug against this brain cancer will reduce your chances of getting it by 90%, or, or even better, uh, eating tomatoes will increase your chances of this particular brain cancer by 20-fold, which sounds really scary until you realise only one person in the world got that brain cancer last year. And that's relative risk, and in that case, Far, far more honest to use absolute risk and say it has increased it from one in a billion to 20 in a billion, in which case you think, fine, I'm sticking with my tomatoes, that's absolutely perfectly okay. With vaccines, we use relative risk. We didn't use absolute risk. And that's what this Telegraph thing was saying, and that's what the court case is about. It's why did you use this misleading one? And the answer is simple, it's because the rate of brain cancer doesn't change, the rate of COVID does change, and eventually we all get it. So uh, you can't use absolute risk because there's no background. But more than that, and I promise you this is the last bit of complex maths, um, if you, the trial design stopped, the trial was designed to stop 
when 1% of the population in the trial was infected. That was in the trial design so that they could get a result. So the highest possible, if you had a vaccine that was 100% effective, the absolute risk reduction could only ever be 1%. So they, 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 they were criticizing a vaccine for being as effective as was possible for it to be because of an artifact, a statistical artifact of the trial design. So this was my second tell because this popped up. If anyone ever said absolute risk was the appropriate thing, I said I'm never listening to you again. And again, that hasn't that hasn't done me badly. Um, and that is <laughs> with, with perhaps a bit too much stats that hopefully uh, hopefully haven't completely sort of ruined it for you. That brings us to about sort of 50 minutes in. I can keep on talking forever because I spent far too much time on COVID, but. I'd really like your questions, and I'll try. Um, <coughs> Thank you very much, Tom. Let's ask for your round of applause, first of all. OK, um, Chairman's privilege, I'm going to ask the first question. But this is a question that has been um, submitted to me. Um, I won't say who by. Um, but it is a, a, I was very interested, uh, Tom, that you said that you're going to be interviewing Bill Gates. I am not. Um, so this is a question about Bill Gates, okay? Could you give an opinion as to Bill Gates, and you may have to ask him next, you know, whenever you see him, but could you give an opinion as to Bill Gates' motive for giving $320 million to the world's leading distributors of news in, and information during, the, during this period? And do you, do you think that the £53 million given to him by the BBC was motivated by love of the independent and hard-hitting investigations the BBC might have done into the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, their injection promotion efforts, and the incredible profits he made from the injection. So I can see, you, you can see where that kind of question is coming from. But do you, I mean, yeah. were you aware of these I mean, massive... We, we did, I think so, there's... We, we, we haven't, there, there is, so the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, but I, I was seeing them to receive my bribe. Um, the, um, they, uh, they fund, I think, they fund a, a thing at the Guardian, uh, no, at the Telegraph, which clearly hasn't gone well for them. Um, they fund a global health thing at the Telegraph, um, and they fund one at the Guardian as well. Um, and, I mean, their stated reason for doing it, as I understand it, is that basically papers don't cover neglected tropical diseases or global health. Um, and so they're funding these because they want, um, they want them covered in the UK. Um, and I suspect they view it as part of their lobbying efforts for the UK government because they work a lot with aid agencies and they try to leverage their money. Um, I don't think Bill Gates made any money out of the vaccines, but I could be wrong. Um, I, I do know he's pledged to give all of his money away. Um, he took a leading role in the pandemic outside of nation states. Um, there were four bodies who basically coordinated the non-Western response and tried to get vaccines to the developing world. Um, there was CEPI, uh, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Initiatives, uh, which had a big tranche of Bill Gates' cash. Um, there was Davi, which he set up, uh, the Global Something Vaccine Initiative. Um, and there was the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And then there was the Welcome, which wasn't him. Um, they stepped into a void that was left. Um, and they didn't achieve what they wanted. Um, we didn't end up, I mean, there is a tremendous amount of resentment that I don't think we even realise in the developing world about the fact that we were busily vaccinating our 20 year olds for the third time before we got vaccines there. And on a um, purely geopolitical sense, uh, you know, that's why we've lost these countries in the Ukraine war and other things. Um, it was, a, I think, it was utterly foolish. Um, but look, he, he's an advisive guy, and a lot of people who speak to him, global public health, don't like the power he wields. Mm. Um, mm. I personally think it's better that a trillionaire is giving away a trillion pounds <coughs> than isn't. Um, but in doing so, he has the power of a nation state. It just seemed a huge amount of money to be given to media organisations. Yeah, look, you know. um, I, don't, I, I don't know the figures. I mean, okay. I'd, have, I'd have to check them. Um, okay. I've been reading a book at the moment about um, Bill Gates 
and it's a very anti-Bill Gates book, and I've chased down the figures, and a lot of them are just simply wrong. Okay. Um, I was hoping to get a more sort of measured critique. Um, but I know, I know that he is funding, I know that he's funding these specific things at the Guardian yeah. and Telegraph, and their argument would be, this is why. Um, it is, we wish, this is news that would not be covered otherwise. And at the Gar certainly at the Telegraph, it never makes the paper. It's not making money for the Telegraph, but they're saying, fine, if you want to give us four reporters funded by you, uh, then go ahead. Uh, I would feel uneasy if it happened at the time. Mm. Um, mm. It would make it very difficult to do what I'm doing this week, which is in Bill mm. Gates. Um, I don't like it, and it feels like an erosion of sort of the firewall between commercial and advertising oh, and various yeah. other things. Yeah. So okay. it's, it's not, but you know, I understand why they're doing it, and I think that's his justification, but I don't particularly like it. Okay. Right, okay, so Dan, what's your question? So, uh, in some newspapers, definitely not yours, but, but some other ones, um, there, there are some trends, like the relative risk thing, also <coughs> having a big headline that says as a question, does a bottle of wine a day uh, reduce your likelihood of stroke? And, you know, at the end of the article, the answer is no. Yeah. But the headline makes it sound like it might be yes, and it's, it's very clickbaity. Do you think that there should be regulations against that sort of thing, that find specific kinds of like that relative best practice at risk, or uh, asking a question whether the answer is down in it seems like it might actually be yes? Do you think there should be regulation against that so that we, there can't be as much um, kind of fake news or misleading uh, stuff in the news? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't think so because I can't think of a way of drafting a law that wouldn't end up with worse outcomes than having it. Um, I mean, I completely, I completely agree with you. Um, we hate writing those things because they're really boring. Um, there is a lot of Christ. Where's this going to be shown? <laughs> there's there's uh, a lot of epidemiology. We, we, can, we can edit it if necessary. <laughs> well, I don't know. There's a lot of epidemiology that I'm not sure what the point of it is, because um, all of those things. Um, Drinking red wine lowers the risk of heart disease. You've got the headline results, which this is a paper that's been published. Um, but then you have to say, paragraph three, this is association rather than causation. It may be that the sort of people who drink red wine have other lifestyle differences that haven't been accounted for in this particular study. And then you're like, well, where am I with this? Um, so I don't, yeah, I, I, I know exactly what you mean. I don't think it should be legislated away because sometimes you, the, the, there will be ones where actually people who smoke get cancer. And you're like, well, that's the most important piece of epidemiology that's been done this century. Um, I don't know how you'd draft the legislation. If you could, from my personal point of view, because I don't li like writing them, I'd love you to, to prevent me from doing so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, Roger? Uh, in terms of the question is how do you trust science? Now, you've obviously got a, a firm belief in general stuff. So, well, not specifically about COVID, but in general, what will convince you that you've gone down the line that it's actually wrong? Well, how much data would need to be presented to say, well, hang on a second? What I thought was correct is actually incorrect. Um, as it's almost you know, what, what, you know, things should be falsifiable. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, I'm trying to think of examples. Um, there were things. I mean, there were things in the pandemic where we definitely changed. Um, so you know, it became apparent that vaccines weren't certainly with the later with the later variants weren't blocking infection. Um, I think the trick is more not to nail your colours to a mast and try to put your identity with something. Um, as a news reporter, I will quite happily cover completely differing sides of a subject um, and do so, you know, news story says this this week, something else contradicts it this week, here's a nice row. Um, with COVID, because you have to explain things, you do end up, I guess, identifying with a camp, which is really bad because... You don't ever want to think, if this turns out wrong, then a part of me is wrong as well. Um, but in, in a, this is completely a bleak answer to your question. Uh, a better answer is it would depend entirely on the subject. You know, it would take me a lot to convince now that the world isn't warming, particularly today. Um, but 
it wouldn't take that much, I guess. It would take five years of the trends going the other direction. You start to think, this is a bit iffy. Uh, and then someone explaining why the thermodynamics is completely wrong. Um, but at the moment, with that, we've got thermodynamic explanation. We've got the trends entirely fitting the thermodynamic explanation, so that's fine by me. Um, I don't know. I hope, I hope I'm not dogmatic. But, uh, yeah, Different new evidence comes. Okay, um, I'll come to you in a minute, David, but uh, Barry, you had a question, and, and Aaron as well. Yes, um, I think what you've very ably demonstrated is that in an evolving and very complex epidemic situation of biomedical events like this going around the world, that certainty arises very, or develops very slowly through the accumulation of evidence, and you have to search the good from the bad. So that certainty is a retrospective animal. And what people were doing at the time was decision making in a context of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And in a context of uncertainty, trust comes in. Now you learned to trust some people and not others, but that was a retrospective judgment. Mm -hmm. <coughs> How do you treat people prospectively? What criteria mm -hmm. would you use? I'm going to trust that lot. This I'm not so sure about. Um, <coughs> I mean, sometimes you just get things wrong. Um, early on in the first week of the pandemic, I first week of the pandemic, the, the week before lockdown, um, there was a paper produced. It was a period when every scientist thought I need to do something, and the paper was produced by an astrophysicist at Imperial where basically I balled the curves and decided we were going to hit 7,000 deaths. And we, I did a story on it, and I got, here's a paper, an imperial prof, off you go. Well, where, how could you go wrong? Um, and it, I learned a lot from that. Um, by fairly rapidly into the pandemic, there weren't many new scientists popping up. And you got a bit of a track record. And the ones I came to trust were often the ones who were expressing the most uncertainty mm -hmm. and were saying we don't know. And there were a few debates that where people on several sides ended up getting very cross. And always the crossest debates were the ones where there wasn't the evidence. Um, so a good example was schools, whether schools should have opened or not. Um, and we knew that children caught COVID. We thought they caught it less. We didn't know if they spread it. Um, we did know during flu, you can literally see when school holidays come. You can see it in the data. School holidays, that's over, because schools act like a hub of the spokes that go out. That didn't happen in COVID, but we just didn't know. And you got this furious debate weighing off impossible you cannot compare the apples and oranges of dead granny versus, you know, you not going to school. Um, I think we probably got it wrong. Um, I've, in my fantasy pandemic, I've restarted. But that was an example of bad, bad evidence and a refusal to correct, collect evidence. In my fantasy pandemic, it's a niche fantasy. In my fantasy pandemic, um, we would have conducted a lot more trials and there would be ways to do them. So uh, if you remember that first lockdown, if we had randomised the country such that, so you accept you've got to close all the schools at the beginning, fine, you're just chucking the kitchen sink at it, but reopen them such that some open a week earlier than others and do it randomly by county in the country. Going into the second lockdown, we and the world would have known exactly how much schools spread COVID. Because we still don't have an answer to that. We have no answer. Another thing that we don't really have an answer to is masks. And this is another one where people got absolutely furious with each other. Um, we, across the world, we basically didn't run a randomised control trial on masks. There were two. There was one in Bangladesh which showed that they had about 12, 13% effectiveness um, in reducing infections. Um, but, you know, not in a, in a country that's far more hotter, far more humid, and a completely different socioeconomic class. That's one country. 
And then there was one trial in Denmark that caused all sorts of shenanigans um, because it didn't find an effect, but it, was, it wasn't able to find an effect unless masks stopped more than 50% of infections. Um, so their conclusion was we can't tell. Um, and there was so much anger about masks from so many scientists who have directed their efforts to actually running a fucking randomised controlled trial early on. So my hope of the learnings is that we get round that uncertainty by actually doing these things. Could I do... I'd really like... To, uh, yeah, yeah, go I, I take what you say, and I actually agree with it wholeheartedly, is that you trust people who are modest about their claims and who are prepared to say, I don't really know. I think that's a very, very powerful statement, and I would very much endorse it. I'm a little, a little medical background, and the people who are absolutely certain are the ones who work. Yes, yeah, and there were a lot of them, and they, they shouted the loudest. <laughs> I'm just wondering... The idea of a cosmologist okay. understanding the massive complexity of biomedical diseases I know, he was just eyeballing a curve and I don't know what I was thinking. Anyway, <laughs> You've just spoken about masks. I would love to do just a quick poll and find out in the room who was a mask sceptic, who was a mask totalitarian and who wants to abstain. You can abstain. Would that be a fun thing to do? Yeah. <laughs> right. All masks. I mean, I totally okay, some, some, right, a, a mask totalitarian is someone who was forever pulling up someone else's mask and making sure that it was above their nose and not just dragging down here, okay? So, just, just a very, very, very quick clip, is that all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who? Do you have some clarification? Oh, right, <laughs> sorry, this might take too long. <coughs> yeah, yeah, there is. <laughs> And the highest okay. Look, this is this is a quick and dirty <laughs> poll. Okay, <laughs> let's not get too scientific about it. Can we have another category? Yeah. I just want to say there's absolutely no point in wearing a mask if you don't have your nose. So that's maybe quite such a good. Okay. This is this is right. Listen, this is totally unscientific. This is totally unscientific. I just want to get a feel for how many people thought were wearing the mask because they thought they had to and they were told to, or people who thought, I'm wearing the mask because I really believe this is actually effective. Okay, so... Can you be <laughs> I'm going to give up on this in a minute. Yeah. It's all about, can we trust science? All right, hands up if you think I should give up on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, there we are. So there was a good point over there. One of the things that really, we're really annoying is we all got so cross about this, and you made the point so <coughs> the Bangladesh trial had within it different categories of masks and they found stronger effects and by the time this came out this had become a sort of shibboleth of politics rather than yeah. actually a medical intervention and the cloth masks had gaps around them they're probably yeah, better yeah. than nothing but they weren't great and given the amount that we were spending on lateral flows on testing on vaccines an 80 pence FFP3 mask that actually probably provided a heck of a lot more protection would have been an amazing investment for everyone but by then we didn't care we were just wearing them to prove who we voted yeah, for yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. okay a um, number of hands going up but uh, David has been waiting David Hi. Yeah. Um, just thinking about the title of your talk can we trust science you've taken quite a retrospective view on sort of examining and analysing data principally in the past. And there's always a cycle, isn't there, uh, about, well, can we trust the data, can we interpret it in the right way? And I wonder if you feel that we've exhausted every possible conceivable statistical methodology uh, to, to work well, out... For adjudicating COVID. ...and the inferences <coughs> we draw. Um, the other side of your question is looking in the opposite direction, in the future. Yeah, um, we don't have data about the future, the future hasn't happened, so we've got to be speculative. And the area that would interest me most uh, would be on what basis do we trust scientists to produce positive outcomes for the benefit of mankind uh, in the future? 
What would you, what would your criteria be for that? Climbing. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll take the first one because it's easier. I should say, I, I, might have got, so I was asked to sort of speak about the vaccines, but in, sort of in the context of... Um, so, um, uh, I think we have done all we can. We've tortured the data far enough on COVID. We have found out everything we can. Um, no, everyone has entrench themselves into their particular COVID camps and aren't going to get out of them. And there's enough global data that you can probably find what you want to back whichever prejudice you wish to have reinforced. Um, I don't think we're going to get much more learnings out of COVID. Um, my worry is we'll get too much learnings out of COVID um, because there's this thing in um, statistics where you overfit the data, where you have a past trend and you precisely fit something to it and then actually all you've done is just made a mathematical equation that precisely says what happens but doesn't help you predict and i'm worried that we will fight this pandemic again and if another one turns up and it's got a slightly different r rate and it infects slight people are infectious for slightly longer or it does spread in children a lot more we will respond with whatever our sort of heuristics to this are and we'll completely bugger it up and we'll be worse prepared than if we hadn't had a pandemic. Um, but in terms of going into the future, I don't know, I mean, the thing about science is, I think a lot of scientists cringed when they heard that phrase, trust the science, mm -hmm. and I know why they came up with it, and I know why they did it, and they were, you know, that was to an extent what they were doing. Um, but science is obviously a process, um, and it's sort of a way of thinking, and looking at COVID, it's really messy. Um, you know, there are honourable people who just loathe each other, <laughs> absolutely loathe each other um, after COVID. Um, so I think we've got to hope that this messy process gets there um, and that we find a way for heterodoxy as well. And because, you know, 90% of the time they are going to be complete nut jobs, um, but there are reasons to listen to the people who aren't going with the herd and these people are really useful and a really useful sort of horsefly on humanity that occasionally nips you and nips you until you realize that they are telling you to go in the right direction but i don't know i think humans just muddle through it's a little bit like your question about how do we stop journalists doing this stuff and i think we don't i mean i apologize for my profession but i don't think we can um and um, so I think, I think science will progress and progress in amazing ways. I was at, a, so I, oh, I was seeing Bill Gates today, I'm seeing him on Friday. The reason I was seeing him today was it was this thing called the Breakthrough Energy Summit, um, which is um, a uh, whole bunch of clean tech um, companies. Just, you wonder and you think, oh, okay, climate change might be solvable. Um, humans are a clever bunch, um, but we're a sort of messy and argumentative bunch as well. Okay, a number of people are waiting. Um, and uh, so, yeah, Paul, Eric, Aaron, and Trevor. And then we'll get to the uh, second bite of the cherry in a minute. Let's go to Aaron next. Uh, yes, yeah, so statistics. So if people are back to the it is, and it's 90% effective, 10% it might not work. But the science, the people who have created it say, well, this, this will kill, I don't know, 10 people in a thousand or something. Is there a number of what the acceptable many people in a thousand of deaths it will, it will kill? And um, following on from that, as you said, the, the next pandemic, are the anti-vaxxers, the anti-mask wearers, the, the rebels, if the next pandemic is uh, a bono or something really evil, they're just going to kill us all, aren't they? Because they're well, I'm not going to lock down, I'm just going to go out and do my own thing, and then they spread it to everybody. I mean, yeah, well, so the first bit, there, there isn't an accepted number, and you get into medical ethics, um, and that was, so that, that slide I had, um, uh, where was it? Uh, this one. This was trying to do that. So this was trying to say, <coughs> basically, very crudely, does it harm more people than it saves? And that's the simplest way of doing it. But I think, I think doctors would say, actually, you get into medical ethics here, and I don't want to give something that's actively causing harm. It's not going to be a sort of straight balancing act. Um, but I, do, I think the, more, the bigger worry in terms of the next pandemic is one that's sort of similar. I think if this one was similar in terms of death rate, I think if this was a 10% death rate, then we would have all, you know, voluntarily locked down. And actually... 
it would have probably been stopped quicker in that sense. Um, but if one works on the margins and where you get into these things, you know, how much is an 80-year-old life worth versus a 10-year-old schooling? But if it kills children and it kills old people and it kills at a high rate, then I think probably we'd all sort of voluntarily lock down. Um, because one of the things we found, I mean, I started with that Neil Ferguson graph at the beginning, um, which actually it comes with so many caveats, but in popular imagination, one of the, re one of the reasons it, that didn't happen, or we get close to it, is we did, everyone was amazed by how much people voluntarily changed their behaviour, and how even when we weren't in lockdown, we saw these massive, massive drops in mobility. You've got this uh, Google and Apple mob mobility data, so you could see at a really fine grain what people were doing. And we basically didn't return to normality until, uh, I think, sort of 2022 or so. OK, uh, Eric, and then Paul, and then Trevor, I will get to you. Eric. I haven't seen <coughs> any actual uh, answers the actual way COVID has spread. Uh, you know, okay, we're about the mask and so on and so forth and lockdown, but I've never seen any actual uh, definite answers to how it's actually spread, that's one thing. And also, you're bound to get a certain number of adverse reactions, uh, either for the infection of a friend of mine who every year had the flu jab. So, no problem at all. One year, she took it and she finished off in intensive care and a very adverse reaction to which is not better. Now that's an example of something happening every single year, you were told to take the flu jab, and here you've got COVID, a one-off situation so far. So what do you do with the adverse reactions? And also, how has COVID really spread? So it was, uh, there was some quite good, um uh, studies where you could sort of trace it through airflow and you could see that the airflow was taking particles to you could look at a room sort of retrospectively and even do genetic analysis which meant that you could see the the tree of infections as they spread and I, I think there's, you know, there's broad consensus it probably wasn't spreading much from surfaces but was a bit um, but it was uh, mainly droplets and airborne, so droplets when you're pretty close to people, um, and then airborne is when it gets into a finer aerosol and spreads further. And it was, it was the latter one that the World Health Organization didn't acknowledge until far too late. Um, and that was, that was the reason why it was so difficult to stop. So wearing a mask was a good idea? Wearing a mask was, I think, if you were to put a gun to my head, I'd say that wearing a mask made a, a difference, not a huge difference, <coughs> Um, partly because we were wearing the wrong sort of mask and partly because you take them off, you know, you haven't got them on permanently. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt as how it spread. It's a question of how effective the masks were at, were at stopping it is a different one. But I'd be surprised if they didn't do something, but they weren't this incredible panacea. Um, and, and as regards the um, adverse right. reactions then, yeah, when okay. people, you know, people treat uh, minimal and those reactions and because of that I'm not going to take anything. Yeah, I mean it's it's difficult. I mean every 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 medical invention intervention is going to have that risk of doing it. Um, and you understand why people, particularly if they sort of had a bad reaction, thinks they don't want to do it again, particularly if the pandemic's over. But during the pandemic I think it was I would think I would go further, I think it was sort of a moral responsibility for people to take it particularly Particularly in the first wave, where actually this one thing, it did stop transmissions. So even if you were healthy and not going to die, um, it really did cut down the size of the wave, and that's something that's been slightly lost. Paul. Oh. <coughs> my, my question isn't really about trusting science, but it is about COVID, so <coughs> I hope it will be interesting. Um, the collaboration between the government and AstraZeneca <coughs> seems to have been a good thing from the point of view of the rest of us. Um, was it an unusual model? And do AstraZeneca and the government see it as successful? And so is it likely to be used again? I don't think AstraZeneca's shareholders see it as successful. Um, it was quite strange. I, I, I'd been speaking to the Oxford vaccine team for quite some time before then. Um, and following these amazing platform vaccines and writing about, you know, you just 
plug stuff in and I might get sort of 300 words on page 40 about the thing and my news editor or whatever, this won't be interesting. Um, but uh, they, they wanted themselves to collaborate with a big pharmaceutical company very early on, mainly because they couldn't run the trials. What, what, so what AstraZeneca brought was, actually they didn't bring the manufacturing, they brought sort of the ability to turn this thing <coughs> into a billion doses um, via the Serum Institute, but they also bought the ability to run the trials, and that's why governments knew they had to collaborate with pharmaceutical companies from the beginning, because only, you know, Pfizer, 40,000 people on three continents, finding the continents where they thought it was going to spread, because you had to have it spreading, that was the thing, they were trying to get this out, and that probably if we'd managed to get, if we'd had an extra month, they could have got the AstraZeneca vaccine out, in trials in the UK, and we could have got, we could have probably got it six months earlier, because if they got it out in the first wave, they'd have got enough infections, but they didn't. Um, so I think the government was very, please, it was a government collaboration in the sense that Kate Bingham worked a lot with them, and that whole Kate Bingham model was was amazing. I remember speaking to her in sort of May of 2020, when she was buying all of these vaccines and buying. She was like she was a venture capitalist, so she was buying the risky ones, which was the mRNA and the AstraZeneca, and then the ones they knew, they were pretty certain they might, you know, these ones are going to work if any are going to work, which were the ones we didn't end up using at all because they came on too late. Um, but one of the things, and I wrote this and I got so much stick from people, I think because people quite justifiably needed hope, but I wrote at the time, and this is one of the great pandemic counterfactuals, what would we be saying now if it hadn't happened? She wasn't confident any of the vaccines would work. Um, her experience of this in pharmaceuticals was probably these are all going, this is worth doing, but balance the probabilities, we're probably not going to get a working vaccine. And imagine now the stick she'd have got, the, stick the government would have got, all these doses that we bought in advance mm. that don't work, and we would have taken completely different learnings from the pandemic. And a lot more of us would be dead. Trevor. I just want to thousand questions I'd like to ask you. I'm going to limit you to one or two, then not a thousand, Trevor. Sticking to one. I just want to know have you read the cumulative analysis of the Trojan Civilization Act that you read to the scientists of the uh, No. Is this, I mean, I read, I read the paper that they produced when that came out, and I've read some of the sort of... Okay. Um, what, what difficult listening to the conversation that basically says everything was all right and the risk benefit was heading in the right direction and vaccines, etc. But um, reading from the front page, this is Pfizer, this isn't, you know, this is Pfizer. Um, 42,000 in the first three months, from the 1st of December 2020 to the 28th of the 2nd, 2021, there were 42,086 adverse reactions of serious events. <laughs> so every, every one of the people involved in the trial had a serious adverse reaction? Uh, no, of the, of the first batch that they delivered, they went on to inject five and a half billion people. Um, this was the first tranche. So this was just the first three months they started injecting. Um, and this is Pfizer, so they would not, they would do everything they could to minimize the negative. Let's not be silly, they were making a hundred billion dollars out of them. Um, so unrecovered, in other words, damaged but hadn't recovered at the point of printing, was 11,361, 1,223 fatal, 9,400 unknown, which is a strange category. So if you extrapolate their own figures to five and a half billion injections, you end up with somewhere between, depending on how many unrecovered of the 11,361, you know, this is generous, and so only 10-15% of We have no idea if the size of the told us. Um, you end up with something like 100,000 people dead 
from a vaccine on the data from the manufacturer that sold it. Um, and I'm just interested to know your opinion. In 1976, H1N1 vaccine was introduced into the United States That's and it yeah. killed 25 people. Yeah. And they called it because it was Yeah. So in 1976, 25 people died from the vaccination campaign for H1N1. 25. And 50 years <coughs> later, <coughs> Their own figures says 100,000 so, Well, I, well so I, I'd extrapolate those figures and say they're a lot higher from the Pfizer. Mm -hmm. I would extrapolate the figures, unless I've misunderstood from the fir first tranche, that on that date would be far higher than 100,000. No, no, this is not from the trial. No, from the first tranche of infections. Yeah, I'd extrapolate that to be a lot higher. Um, so the, the H1N1 thing, I mean, the, the, so they gave out this, it was swine flu in 76, it was swine flu, and they gave out this vaccine in advance because they didn't know the fertility rate and they were really worried. And 25 people died of Guillain Barr syndrome, which is something that's often um, uh, induced by vaccines. Um, and they pulled it, they pulled it because, as it turned out, H1N1 wasn't dangerous. Um, it, it's, its fertility rate was similar to normal flu. Um, so there's no risk benefit. Um, the, I, well, the, the data, I, I have uh, spent four years having people throw data like this at me. Um, I think it's very similar to the yellow card data that I brought up at the beginning. Pfizer don't have a way of knowing in the first tranche what adverse reactions are caused by. They cannot establish causality. Now, they the people. They, they Pfizer they buried the people. Free. Well, they stopped breathing. I know, I know, they but had doctors yeah. Who could say, "Oh, that person's dead," and they counted the bodies. And it was one thousand two hundred. Oh, okay, but that's so, so. We started. Another fifty-five. Yeah. Which they did. Okay. Yeah. Sixty-seven thousand. Well, so the, the first. So my first answer is, if it's happening at that <coughs> level, then I don't understand why we haven't seen it in national data. But my second answer is, this is precisely why I brought up the yellow card data at the beginning. If you start injecting, particularly if you start injecting with people in care homes aged over 80, what's going to happen in the weeks following is a lot of them are going to die. And you are going to get a lot of people getting sick. And part of the protocols of... Or would you not? I mean, if it gives you immortality, that would be marvellous. But the, the, the problem with collecting this data is what I went through at the beginning. You cannot establish causality. You can establish that someone has been injected, and then you can establish that something bad has happened to them. What you then need to establish, and you have to record that data, which is what Pfizer did, and which is what actually the government regulators did, you have to record that data. But what you then need to establish is are these adverse events happening at a higher rate in the people who have received the vaccines? And that is an incredibly difficult statistical task to do, but it's been done. And that has not established those figures, which if those figures were true, you would then also be dealing with things that would start showing up on the national graph. Are you saying they were suggesting they recorded adverse events? Trevor, um, I can't let this just turn into a debate between the, the two of you. Um, but, um, but anyway, th thanks for answering that. Um, okay, so Dan, is there anyone who hasn't... Let, let, I'm going to come to <coughs> David, or anyone who hasn't a asked a question, Dan, just to be fair. So David. Uh, <coughs> uh, sorry, I didn't read it. There was a small article in The Guardian this morning, I don't know what you... It's all right, I used to write for them. <laughs> Even the Manchester Guardian. <laughs> and it said that there were, in the terms of the number of deaths from COVID, <coughs> compared to the number of deaths from lung cancer caused by smoking, the latter was about 20 or 30 percent more than the COVID deaths. Yet nobody cares about it. It's not even, it's not even relevant. Yeah. You know, it, it's, not, it's not something that we... You mean during the same period? The yeah, yeah. You know, people dying of smoking related diseases is just sort of rather accepted. Yeah, I mean, part of it is, I, I, don't, I don't know the exact thing <coughs> during the same period or not, but um, uh, 
It, it would surprise me at the same period because I think the biggest killers are heart disease and dementia and then other cancers. But, um, but one of the issues, and this was a thing that was driving our policy far more than they ever admitted, um, it wasn't the deaths that were really the concern, it was the collapse of the NHS. It was the... Um, that they were, if it, so far as there was a revealed preference of the government, and as so far as, you know, when I was chatting to modelers and stuff, as so far as they understood what they were being asked to do, it was, do deaths stay below a thousand a day? Um, because a thousand COVID deaths a day was when they thought what they'd just seen happened in Italy would happen here. Um, and so we weren't actually trying to save the elderly we were trying to prevent this thing they called it a sort of non-linear collapse where once you go above that people start dying of all sorts of things and people start being in, just left in hospital car parks and stuff um, so it was the extra deaths on top of what and actually if you look back historically you know I think the, the sort of the death rate in the UK went up to what it was in 2000 or something so we've been busily improving on mortality rates but it's this sudden spike at a sudden moment that was really, really scaring them. Dan, you've been waiting patiently. Go ahead. Um, <coughs> I feel that I have no choice almost but to trust back experts because it's, it's impeasible for me to gain enough knowledge that I can actually rival them and decide whether they're correct. An example of this is that I, I realised a couple of days ago that I don't understand the mechanism by which any of the medicines I take work. And I, I a lot of your doctors don't. I mean, a lot of scientists. The people who make them don't. I trust, I trust that somewhere down the line, some kind of people did understand it, and it's not just random chemicals, but it, uh, they, someone understands it. Um, but I have to trust that, because I, I can't verify it myself. Although well, if I did, it would be a huge amount of my life that I'd have to turn the expert. <laughs> um, so if my doctor tells me he thinks like, that I should be injected with something, I should say, yes, okay. <laughs> Even have to study what it is. Yeah. Um, which I, I suppose that has implications for the idea of whether or not I'm giving informed consent, because yeah. I'm, I'm relatively informed, but not not very very informed. Um, but I I think that me trusting the doctors to be correct is better than me just guessing what's correct. But if, if they just gave me access to all the chemicals and let me pick the gen one for the best, I'd probably make a worse decision than the doctor would. I guess to an extent you have to slightly trust the process um, but you know so, so as MPIC the um, GLP1 antagonist they're not really sure what, there was this sort of quite neat hypothesis about what it was doing and how it was suppressing appetite and there's more and more data coming through that it's doing other things that we really hadn't expected in ways that we really don't understand. So uh, I think actually quite often, there, I think there are plenty of drugs where we don't completely understand why they work, but we do have safety trials and we do have efficacy trials and then they seem to work. But yeah, I think, I think you're, look, you're, um, you're, you're describing the dilemma all of us have and may, maybe to an extent, you know, we're being credulous fools, but um, you have to... I can't just brush up on quantum mechanics every time I use a semiconductor. Um, and so I guess you have to have a slight trust in the process and understand how it works. But then, then you're being trusting, you know, yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you have to hope that people can flag things that, that might make it more worrying. Tom, can, can we apply this question of trust to what's sometimes called big pharma? So we've been talking about Pfizer a lot. So you as a science journalist, you know, do you trust Pfizer or are you sceptical or are you, you know, what, how much trust can you put in Pfizer and, and the whole chain of, of, you know, things that happen from, from, from there onwards? Um, pharmaceutical companies definitely do, nefarious might be going too far, um, but they're commercial companies. Um, and there are various things they do that aren't great. Some of them have been fixed. One of them is trials. Um, not being pre-registered. It's only recently you have to pre-register trials. And they're trial drugs and they're not published the results. And so you'd end up with a situation where you don't get the negative results because they're not interested in the negative results in the drugs. Or often you'll get drugs that are tried out and they're actually no better than an existing one, but they've sh 
show that they work in inverted commas and then that keeps their patent going. Um, or you've, you've got situations where you can look at papers that have been sponsored by pharma and you can see that they're consistently more positive in their results than ones that haven't. And you can't spot anything in the methodology, and I don't think there is anything in the methodology, but they're a human process, and human biases can come in in all, all sorts of ways. Um, but it costs a billion pounds to get a drug to market. Most of the drugs fail. Um, we don't have another way of doing this. Um, and I think they, you know, they've come to our aid in so many ways. Um, but yeah, you've got to be sceptical of them, of course you have, but uh, you can be too sceptical of them because ultimately this is the way that everything gets financed and functions. And I just add something to that. I mean, it's really, I mean, it's really interesting talking about this farmer. But I was recently in London with the doctors without borders, the MSA, and they were talking about how they now. But his data was absolutely fascinating because he, MSF, for the first time ever, have actually crossed a clinical trial. A clinical trial by a pharma company has never ever been crossed out until they actually did this, did this study at MSF. So, you know, we do, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm not against big pharma or anything like that, and I'm not making a case against them or for them, but I just wanted to put that fact out there. Because you know we get told all the time it takes so long to get a drug to market, and it costs so and so much, and I'm mean, sure they have uh, you know transparency over a lot of the costs associated with the research and all the sort of stuff and the manufacturing, but they have never ever, and I don't know whether they actually have the data, published the cost of the thing. Right, that's interesting. And that was, I thought that was, that was a really, really interesting <coughs> You mean the trial or the, from the Petri the trial, dish the to trial, the... You know, the, the, right. the, the clinical trials from phase one to Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I just thought yeah. I'd no, that thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're nearly out of time. John and John and Roger and Steve, okay. <clears throat> so will you please keep your question brief and concise? Thank you, John. John, do you think um, if the pharmaceutical industries were liable for uh, error in particular with vaccinations, that they would improve their research, improve, improve their free market um, efforts? Um, so there's, it depends what you mean by liable for error. I mean, in a lot of countries they are. During the pandemic, they got waivers. Um, essentially, there was this... So. I spoke to Albert Borer about this from Pfizer. Um, they were going to operate in 200 different countries and they didn't want to be sued in 200 different countries in the middle of a pandemic. Um, normally they are um, and certainly liable for, uh, you know, for, for negligence and, and any, anything that is actively nefarious. But we have the reason we have the regulators is because they're assessing the evidence that's put in front of them now if the evidence is fiddled that becomes a criminal matter and it's more than just being liable to be sued it's to, to go into prison um i i mean everything happened very fast in the pandemic and i do if, if what you're referring to is their sort of indemnities that was the reason i, I was given they just said look we, you want us to send this at cost price to all of these countries, we'll do it, but not if we're going to end up having to go through the courts in every single country with late legal systems we don't understand. John. Just an easy one to finish up with. Um, how, how worried do you think we should be about the antibiotic uh, issue of antibiotics becoming ineffective? Hugely. Yeah. I mean. And, and, and Secondly, what should we do about it? <laughs> um, it's a classic market failure. Um, I've been covering it since I started science. Um, so we're getting resistant to antibiotics. We haven't had a new class of antibiotics, as in an antibiotic that acts in a new and unusual way for, I think, about 30 years. Um, uh, the problem is, if you, to encourage drug companies, and this is when we're talking about you know, the drug company model, in order to encourage them to produce antibiotics, 
they want to have a market. But for a hospital, they want to have an antibiotic that's a big brand spanking new antibiotic, and then they don't want to use it unless they have to. They want to use the antibiotic we have now and save the last resort antibiotic for the last resort. So you're saying to a pharmaceutical company, will you spend whatever on developing this? And then you're saying to them, but by the way, we don't want to buy it. Um, and this is, there's been several proposals of how to deal with this, but none of them have been, have, well, none of them have got results yet. And each year, more and more people get stuff that can't be dealt with by antibiotics. Isn't it the case of government stepping in? <coughs> um, yeah, I think it probably is. Um, there was, the, I think, the O'Neill review where they came up with this model where they'd pay, the NHS would pay a subscription. And so it would pay a, it'd be like a Netflix of antibiotics. So rather than sort of saying, I'm paying for each one I use, I'm paying for their existence. Um, there is, but it's still, maybe it's just really hard to find antibiotics. I mean, there are a lot of companies working on it, and I've, I've covered loads that have had this really promising stuff and then heard absolutely nothing else. We are out of time, but guys, be really brief. Roger. Yeah, sure. Okay, Steve. Sure. Uh, just going back to the big final question, David. I mean, um, what's been the recently the basic thing about the including farmer in America and the opioid scam? Seems a lot to me. I might be wrong, but it, it's very hard for them in America to actually make a case that it's the drug thing. Um, would you say that the systems in this country work better than maybe in America? I think there's so many vested interests that it's yeah. months and months or maybe even years to sort of make put Purdue Farmer on the spot for the top problems and how to get drugs accordingly. Yeah, I think that's. I'd like to think they work better, but I don't think they do. And it's sort of a classic case where it's not massively. It, it, it's not like this is something to be picked up, this sort of way broader societal sweep of the drug doing exactly what you expect it to do, which is making you feel better and then, you know, zonking you out. But you end up with this massive opioid crisis. I don't think we'd pick it up, and I think people are absolutely petrified because you're starting to see these drugs coming into the UK now. I think the NHS is better at preventing things like that getting given out, simply because it's a monolithic Stalinist institution, getting given out to patients when it doesn't want them to. Um, but I don't think it's any more sensible for all of that. Tom, thanks very much for your great talk and uh, for answering all the questions. <laughs> okay.